Good morning. The new Christy Minstrel's here. November 14th, 1965. The first major conflict between the U.S. Army and the North Vietnamese will happen along the Drong River and be known as the Battle of Ia Drong. Most importantly, it will be a harsh lesson in the unforgiving terrain of Vietnam. The newly formed 1st Cavalry Division includes an old regiment, the 7th Cavalry. In times past, its most famous commander was General George Armstrong Custer. Their first battle may parallel Custer's own ignominious defeat. The 1st Cavalry is in hot pursuit of a North Vietnamese regiment retreating from the attempted destruction of a U.S. Special Forces camp. On this day, the 7th Cavalry Regiment's 1st Battalion find themselves in the Ia Drang Valley on a search and destroy mission. 16 helicopters shuttle Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore's Bravo Company into landing zone X-ray on the northeast side of Chu Pong Mountain. They are to secure the area to prepare for the arrivals of Alpha, Charlie, and Delta companies. It will be a hard lesson in the unforgiving Vietnamese terrain. LZ X-ray looks deceptively flat and open from the air, but on the ground is a different matter. Five-foot-high elephant grass is perfect cover for enemy soldiers. Enormous anthills dot the area, large enough to cover weapons units. Colonel Moore is aware of NVA troops in the area, but not of the three regiments lurking nearby, ready to attack the outnumbered Bravo Company. It is an unarmed NVA deserter, discovered by Bravo's first platoon, who reveals the bloodthirsty enemy lying in wait. Bravo intensifies their search as Alpha Company arrives to secure the LZ. Bravo's first platoon does not search for long. Just after noon, they are flanked on both sides by an equally sized enemy force. Bravo's second platoon rushes to aid them. En route, they pursue a fleeing squad of enemy troops and are soon cut off from the rest of the platoon. Men in the platoon's third squad spot 20 North Vietnamese scrambling to large anthills off their left flank. The third opens fire. As they exchange fire, a U.S. grenadier finds the enemy range and pumps several grenade rounds into their position. A volley of enemy fire cuts into the platoon's right flank, killing the heroic grenadier and pinning the rest of the squad. With heavy enemy fire from all sides, the third managed to reach the platoon's main body and form a tight perimeter. NVA fire kills four U.S. machine gunners, and then they use the fallen soldier's M60 against its own men. Bravo's trapped second platoon remains outnumbered, and the first and third platoons rush in to help. Will they arrive in time? Meanwhile, Alpha and part of Charlie companies land at 1330 hours. It is not a safe landing, as rounds of 60 and 81 millimeter mortar slam into the elephant grass in the LZ's center. Colonel Moore rushes an Alpha platoon to help the beleaguered Bravo amidst this chaos. Alpha Company, 2nd Platoon Leader, 2nd Lieutenant Walter J. Marr, bravely pushes his men forward in a skirmish from the hot LZ and towards the sound of enemy fire. His men meet up with a platoon from Bravo Company and continue on. 
they spot a force of khaki-clad NVA soldiers moving across their front from left to right. It is the same enemy troops that had separated the second. Both sides incur casualties in the fierce firefight. The NVA troops break off and, unknown to Marm, are maneuvering behind him. Not wasting time, Marm gathers his wounded and sends a squad leader off to the LZ with them. The man returns shortly after. They are surrounded. Things are also grim for the others. Moore's battalion is at the receiving end of enemy artillery on LZ X-ray. The remaining Charlie and lead of Delta companies are only able to put down half their men because of the firefight. The remaining eight choppers are ordered to stay away by Colonel Moore. The second squad, still surrounded by NVA, suffer leadership losses as they are cut down in manpower. The 27-men squad loses eight and suffer 12 wounded. Marm and his men get 100 yards from this lost platoon before machine gun fire comes at them from 30 yards ahead, stopping them in their tracks. Marm goes out into the open to pinpoint the enemy's exact location. Finding the bunker, he orders one of his men to fire a LAW, a light anti-tank weapon, into the anthill bunker. Affected by the humidity, the LAW misfires. Marm takes the LAW rocket, rearms it, and fires it into the enemy bunker himself. But it's not enough. The machine gun fire keeps coming. Marm rushes from cover to the anthill. Risking his own life, he hurls a grenade over the anthill. Several NVA soldiers are killed in the explosion. The remaining ones are killed by Marm and his M16. He signals his men to move forward. They leave cover to join him. Then, an NVA bullet meets its mark in Marm's lower jaw. A medic arrives and gets Marm back to the LZ. He flies off to base camp, having saved the mission and the lives of his men. Sergeant Ernie Savage, the fourth to assume command of the Lost Platoon, organizes a defense and calls precision artillery strikes in, ones that protect his men by driving the enemy back. They last throughout the night before units from both 1st and 2nd Battalions join them the next day. For his actions that day, Sergeant Savage will receive the Distinguished Service Cross. Lieutenant Joe Marr receives the Medal of Honor for his bravery. Helicopter pilots Major Bruce Crandall and Captain Ed Freeman also receive the Medal of Honor for their flights in and out of X-ray shuttling ammunition and supplies in and carrying wounded soldiers out. President George W. Bush grants Freeman his medal in 2001 and Crandall his in 2007. It is over 30 years since the actions that earned them. Major Crandall flew the men back to base where the injuries could be treated. At that point he had fulfilled his mission but he knew that soldiers on the ground were outnumbered and low on ammunition. So Major Crandall decided to fly back into X-ray. He asked for a volunteer to join him. Captain Ed, Captain Ed Freeman stepped forward. In their unarmed choppers, they flew through a cloud of smoke and a wave of bullets. They delivered desperately needed supplies. They carried out more of the wounded even though medical evacuation was really not their mission. If Major Crandall had stopped here, he would have been a hero. But he didn't stop. He flew back into X-ray again and again. Fourteen times he flew into what they call the Valley of Death. He made those flights knowing that he faced what was later described as an almost unbelievably extreme risk to his life. Over the course of the day, Major Crandall had to fly three different choppers. Two were damaged so badly they could not stay in the air. 
Yet he kept flying until every wounded man had been evacuated and every need of the battalion had been met. When they touched down on their last flight, Major Crandall and Captain Freeman had spent more than 14 hours in the air. They had evacuated some 70 wounded men. They had provided a lifeline that allowed the battalion to survi survive the day. Captain Freeman's citation, decades after his heroic action. Captain Freeman's selfless acts of great valor, extraordinary perseverance, and intrepidity were far above and beyond the call of duty or mission and set a superb example of leadership and courage for all his peers. Captain Freeman's extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. As for Crandall, his is no less sterling or any less long awaited. Major Crandall's voluntary decision to land under the most extreme fire instilled in the other pilots the will and spirit to continue to land their own aircraft and in the ground forces the realization that they would be resupplied and that friendly wounded would be promptly evacuated. This greatly enhanced morale and the will to fight at a critical time. His actions provided critical resupply of ammunition and evacuation of the wounded. Major Crandall's daring acts of bravery and courage in the face of an overwhelming and determined enemy are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. By the end of 1965, the U.S. military has 184,000 military personnel in South Vietnam. They are joined by South Vietnamese soldiers and combat troops from Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Thailand. These and other nations are legitimately concerned about the communist expansion into South Vietnam at a time when so many countries have swiftly fallen to communism. The commitment of the U.S. to stand against the communist expansion and their inability to reach a diplomatic solution results in a war that will last another 10 years after the start of Rolling Thunder. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.